Hello, you're watching the Open Telco Infra Summit, part of our year-round DSP leaders coverage. I'm Guy Daniels. Now, why should telcos move their workloads to the public cloud? Why not build their own network cloud delivery platforms optimized to run their unique workloads and which can support targeted digital services for their customers? Well, to discuss the challenges and the pitfalls of building your own open and disaggregated network cloud, I'm joined today by Terrier Jensen, who is SVP Network and Cloud Technology Strategy at Telenor, Manish Singh, who is CTO, Telecom Systems Business at Dell Technologies, Beth Cohen, SDN Network Product Strategy at Verizon Business Group, Vivek Chada, who is SVP and Global Head of Telco Cloud at Rakuten Symphony. Paul Miller, Chief Technology Officer at Wind River. And Rahul Atri, who is Consulting Analyst with Apple Door Research. Hello, everyone. It's really good to see you. Thanks so much for taking part. Now, there's so much talk at the moment about using the public cloud, and we'll get onto that in a moment. But first, let's start with the alternative. What are the benefits for a telco of building and deploying its own network cloud platform? Terry, let's come across to you to start us off with this question. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Guy. So, of course, uh, quite an interesting uh, question. And uh, and just to remove any kind of discussion at the very beginning, we have from Telnor part uh, also a public cloud first strategy. Uh, but uh, what we see is that where we are right now, uh, building a telco cloud uh, has its uh, advantages uh, and also is uh, kind of the thing to do in order to comply with all the requirements what we see. Uh, I think it's also very important, fundamental that uh, even though you build your own cloud, you still need to use components which can scale. So it's not like you know uh, are making up your own components, but you really need to benefit from from the full scale uh, across different industries. So the factors about what we are seeing and uh, looking into uh, when we are assessing different uh, cloud options, uh, and that's also coming back to the benefits. What you are what you are raising in the question, the factors include, for example, uh, uh, does the solution comply with the regulatory requirements? Uh, what are the financial look like, meaning the cost levels, for example? Uh, what about the performance? Uh, and also, also fundamental, what are the customer requirements and the customer perception when it comes to, for example, local di data and also when it comes to the security specific aspects. So, so it's important to look into all these, uh, these factors in order to assess, uh, which in some cases turn out to be favorable in terms of the telco cloud. But of course, these factors also are developing over time. So I think it's important to, to keep a monitoring on the different options there uh, as both the telco cloud and the uh, public cloud uh, solutions are evolving. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much, Terry. And as you, you said earlier, th this isn't a binary choice. It's not either or. Um, we, you know, that we're often looking at, at, at both examples here. And Beth, um, what's, what's your thoughts? What's your recommendation? Why, why should a telco deploy its own network cloud platform? I, th I think it really depends upon the telco. Uh, and I'll use the example of Verizon. Verizon is a very large global telco. We have a large footprint in many, many countries. Um, and, and obviously, we're, um, so for us, it makes more sense for to at least use some of our own resources. Um, you know, we certainly can, and it's more cost effective in some cases. Also, the, the, uh, the internal cloud is also, um, can be more customized for the telco uses. Uh, I know public cloud, uh, providers, you know, talk about how they're they're making their public clouds telco friendly, um, <clears throat> and we certainly do use um, public cloud for at least some of our um, deployments and some of our applications. But uh, we have found that uh, many of the very uh, telco um, sensitive uh, product, uh, you know, services that we offer really make more sense to keep to keep those clouds in house. Um, so, um, and, and again, it's a matter of control. And, and as also mentioned, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, you know, um, subject to regulatory requirements that uh, public clouds frequently aren't. Uh, so in general, I would say we have a keep it in house first uh, policy currently. Obviously we're always looking at the, 
the economics and the you know changes in the industry um, to see what what works best for us. Thank you very much, Beth. Um, and Manish, let's come across to to you because we've heard from our two operators on the panel. What's your what's your advice to to your customers and and your partners when they, when they're looking at maybe building their own platforms? Yeah, th thank you. Uh, thanks for having us uh, today. Uh, I, I think it's very clear. I mean, uh, we, we heard a little bit about the regulatory aspects, but when we think about from a network perspective. Uh, there are multiple constraints here as well. At the end of the day, uh, networks have to conform to certain KPIs, have to deliver certain performance throughput, latency, etc. And these these put constraints on what the cloud underlying cloud infrastructure should be and where it's placed. Uh, let me just give some examples. For example, you have uh, RAN workloads, uh, which is now uh, becoming more and more cloud native, especially with Open RAN. Uh, and these are very real time sensitive workloads. You cannot take these workloads and start to put them in some public cloud infrastructure uh, because you have front hall latency constraints that have to be met to deliver the performance and the KPIs that the networks to have to conform to. There are also, when you build a horizontal private telco cloud, it starts to give you the flexibility of where you want to place your network functions. And this can have direct impact on the user experience. Let me give you an example. Video continues to be the fastest growing traffic on these networks. And uh, many of the service providers are looking at architectural flexibility where they can bring in user plane functions uh, as well as uh, caching functions more towards the edges of the network. So when you have a horizontal telco cloud, that the operators deploy, it starts to give them this kind of flexibility as to where you can place your workloads and deliver improved customer experience for different kind of uh, workloads. Uh, so th th there are more things, but, uh, but but let me just uh, add one more thing, right? I mean, certain workloads might require acceleration capabilities. Uh, again, I mean, uh, I can take uh, uh, RAN is an example which might require some layer one accelerations. You might have uh, user plane functions which might require certain DPU or IPU kind of offload or acceleration capabilities. Again, building that horizontal cloud infrastructure as a network cloud gives the service providers the flexibility, if they so choose to, to take advantage of acceleration functions when and where they so choose to be. So there are many benefits uh, uh, and many performance-related reasons uh, to do this. Thanks very much, Manish. Some very clear benefits you articulated there. That's great. And uh, uh, Vivek, let's come across to you. You know, what's, what would your advice be to, to your partners and customers? Why should they build their own? Uh, Guy, first of all, thanks for having us. Uh, great topic um, and an excellent panel. Um, I think a lot's already been covered in uh, what uh, Beth, uh, Terry, and Manish mentioned. I'd like to bring in one more aspect of an advantage that the telcos get when they try and build their own private cloud. First is the definition of what's a telco cloud, right? Um, a lot of the performance characteristics that Manish spoke about are very, very different from traditional generic IT functions that generally the world, the B2B world has gotten used over the last 10 years by moving them to the public cloud. Um, Teddy did point out that it is a shifting landscape. So uh, things will probably evolve to make a lot of those characteristics more suitable or practical uh, as we move forward, but they're not there yet. So that's one consideration uh, that the telco cloud itself imposes certain uh, finite characteristics that are probably better delivered within a private cloud uh, implementation. Uh, the second is this lovely phrase that's uh, gone around for a few years now, uh, telco to techco. I think uh, there's a interesting co-opetition, if you will, with the OTT players uh, where they consume a significant part of the network resources, but obviously the revenues are outsized compared to what the telcos are doing in returns to the investment. Um, and we've got Talon and Verizon on the panel as well, so I'm sure they have a view on this. I think one of the things that the techcos uh, that are really successful have done is that they've understood what is core to their business and what is differentiated and what is commodity. And I would say that for an individual telco, and I kind of agree with Beth that it depends on the telco, you have to have an assessment of what is core to you and what is differentiated in your secret sauce on how you want to deliver your services and customer experience to your customer. 
if every telco can consume the same set of services from, let's say, a fixed set of cloud providers in the public cloud, uh, where would you go find that differentiation from uh, becomes a slightly narrower space. So I think uh, one is the actual telco cloud characteristics. The second is the telco to techco sort of move. And I think things like private cloud, especially with cloud native, etc., are a key enabler for that. Yeah, thanks very much, Vivek. And as, as you say there, it's kind of playing into the bigger strategic picture as well. Um, Raul, let's come across to you. you you've, you've heard from um, a couple of our vendors and, and telcos on the panel. Um, you know, what can you add? What are you seeing from, from your vantage point as the benefits of, of building your own, or as Vivek said, you know, rolling your own cloud? Well, uh, such a position to be after five of my peers have given all the input. I personally think it is very much like owning a manual transmission car versus an automatic hybrid. Um, the automatic does give you all the possibilities and on, on the new plugins and all features which are available on, the, on just a click of a button or a pedal. Uh, on the manual side, you have to do a lot of learning yourself. You have to manage things, learn the skills of maneuvering the gearbox, the clutch, uh, the steering all together. It's very much like when you have your uh, private cloud, where you learn the culture of how to manage a cloud, how to build a cloud, how to manage the life cycle of an application, how to have control, how to build security layer on top of it, orchestration layer on top of it. Uh, the public cloud comes with all, all the plugins and all utilities, database as service, red memcache as service, all the possibilities which they have learned all the three years with number of application architectures, they provide you all the, all the feature set. Uh, we personally believe that uh, having the edge or your private cloud instance first give you the skill set and understanding of how to run your workloads how to even maneuver your ecosystem towards more cloud nativeness and how to build an organization around who knows the deep end understanding of how to run applications it also provides you more control um, maybe understand the return on investments understand which kind of app applications and architecture should be on cloud hybrid cloud multiple cloud or even let's say even the architecture between the edge uh, and and the central data centers uh, apart from that, uh, private cloud also comes with a lot of information and understanding. Ultimately, it's all the same chassis, right? It's, it's again, the same, either an OpenStack version or a Kubernetes version. What you're building on top of is the uh, possibilities and orchestration and capabilities to, to do a lot of DevOps, to manage lifecycle, to define policies. Uh, so if you, if you kind of start with the manual transmission, if you start with your own cloud, uh, try out things, learn, uh, I think the the switch over to public cloud will be much more beneficial. Uh, and also, uh, you can also take calls later on to come back. But if you start with a with an automatic transmission directly with the public cloud, you'll never have the, as an organization, you'll never have the skills and understanding and learnings of how to manage your own cloud, how to how to deliver things uh, through the pipelines and understanding of of how to manage the, uh, the, the cloud site yourself. Great, thanks, Ru. I do like the cloud analogy there, building from the, the common chassis. I do like that. Um, we'll come to uh, Manish uh, in a moment, but Paul, let's uh, get your input as well. What, what's your thoughts as to the, the benefits of building their own network? Thanks, Kai. I think there's a few interesting points that have been made so far. Uh, one that you really have to look at is the requirements for high availability. Generally, these services that a service provider are offering are held to 5.9's performance standards. And that often means that the infrastructure is held to six nines. And typically that can only be met by the operator building a private cloud instance. Now, there is certainly a role for public cloud. If we look at things like content delivery and gaming and uh, offboarding IT enterprise backend functions like billing systems, those can be um, appropriately leveraging hybrid cloud infrastructure from the public service providers. Um, however, when you get into the, the core and the edge of the network, where real-time mission critical services are deployed at high availability, that's one important factor. Another one that's really important is as you move more towards the edge of the network, we talked a moment ago about virtual RAN and open RAN technologies, running near real-time applications, that's critically, that, that, that's really at the far edge of the service provider network and a public cloud provider cannot simply provide that geolocation. Um, that's really what the service provider owns, their access network. Uh, additionally, as we've gone forward over the past couple of years, we've seen you know, the initial interest in virtual RAN moving to open RAN and, and really the, the internal struggles about how 5G should be deployed, that's really started to change. Now we're looking at the real reasons for 5G and things like network slicing and the new applications that can be deployed at the edge of the network. These represent new monetization streams, new revenue streams for the service provider. 
things like vehicle to X, you know, uh, vehicle to infrastructure and vehicle to vehicle capabilities for the automotive sector, uh, drone delivery systems, um, automotive manufacturing, and industrial manufacturing. These are new applications. And in many cases, that is compute at the edge. And that requires the service provider to be able to put multiple applications in their network. They can't do that if that's all sitting in a public cloud somewhere. So I do think, Guy, you had the right point. It is not an either or, it's a both. And there's an appropriate use for the tools of a, a public cloud in a carrier network. But then as you get more towards the, the core and edge mission critical applications for telecom infrastructure, as those become more software defined, you have to look at a private cloud technology uh, in order to realize those revenue streams. Yeah, indeed. Thank you very much, Paul, for, for those comments. Uh, absolutely. Uh, before we move on, I just want to go back to Manish, just because I believe, Manish, you wanted to come in and pick up on uh, some points that were made earlier. Yeah, yeah thanks, Guy. I mean, uh, I actually just wanted to add to what Paul said, uh, the, the one aspect, which is as you build your horizontal network cloud, it opens up a lot of monetization opportunities as well uh, for the service providers and create net new revenue streams, especially with Edge. Uh, and Edge, in, if you think about it, it creates opportunities to really work on the data, where it's created, when it's created, and create actionable insights on that data, rather than also shuttling things all the way up into a centralized cloud and, and down. And a lot of the enterprises are looking for those opportunities. So whether you're looking from a video analytics or, or, or other kind of applications, uh, there's a whole new op world of opportunity with the edge that starts to open up for the telcos uh, as we start to think about building that horizontal network cloud. Thank you very much, Manish. Well, we've, we've had a, a good number of uh, examples and insights as to um, why it makes sense and when it makes sense. But what about when it doesn't make sense? When would it make more sense to use the public cloud instead of building your own? What are the drawbacks to a telco run network cloud? And I know we've touched on a few of these um, earlier, but let's get specific on a few if we can. And Beth, let me come to you first. Well, there's two drawbacks. One, the expense. Um, you know, clouds are not cheap. Let's not pretend they're not that they are. Um, so, and they take a while to build. So, you know, that's the other drawback, which is flexibility and and the ability to launch quickly. Uh, that's become really critically important. And the public cloud, you know, they've already built the infrastructure, and we just have to tap into it. So that's that's an advantage. That's a disadvantage to building our own. An advantage to using the public cloud. Uh, <clears throat> however, um, so, and, and again, it, and as I mentioned earlier, it depends upon the telco. You know, Verizon, we do use public cloud to a certain extent, but mostly, um, you know, not, not certainly not for our infrastructure. Uh, and another disadvantage is um, that, you know, you have to, you have to build it all over the place. Right? So it, it can't be, it can't be as centralized as the public cloud because that's what the public cloud is. It's very centralized, and you and again, it takes time to build out that that distributed network. Uh, I think the edge, as we mentioned earlier, is very important, um, and the regional edge as well as the edge, the extreme edge, if you will, um, and all of those together um, are just you know it's a lot of complexity. Um, and you know, it requires a lot of talent um, and a lot of capital to build all of this stuff. Thanks, Beth. As you say, expense absolutely, and uh, and uh, the need to build everywhere. Um, Paul, did you want to come in as well and uh, discuss some of the the drawbacks and disadvantages of um, a token run network cloud? Yeah, thanks, Guy. I, I think we've seen a couple of things. It, depending on the service provider that looks to adopt Telco Cloud you may not have uh, necessarily the expertise within the company. The staffing the company, obviously as you bring in a modern network cloud, you're talking not only OpenStack at the core of the network, but often advanced Kubernetes systems for the edge of the network and near edge. Um, that requires expertise in cloud native technologies, orchestration, software defined networking, compute infrastructure, disaggregation of the application from the hardware, and then interacting with a lot of vendors that bring that 
um, un, you know, distributed system into your network, right? It's not an integrated solution coming from a single vendor, such as an Ericsson into your network. It's now disaggregated with hardware from Dell and infrastructure from Wind River and applications from, from the telecom equipment manufacturers. And that's a significantly more complex technology integration that happens in a lot of service providers. So uh, in many ways, as you look towards a public cloud provider, that can be leveraged for what we call a tier two or tier three service provider that may not have the skills to do that. The other thing that's really important is choosing partners that can bring in managed services and professional services to help you engineer, deploy and operate those systems, even implement, build, operate and transfer models uh, where companies that have the expertise for deploying and operating these networks um, have the ability to come in and help you design and deploy these systems and then turn them over to you as your teams build expertise. Now, in a tier one space, we don't see that happen as much. Usually there's enough staffing and expertise. And with the history of NFV that we have behind us, a lot of cloud expertise now in service providers, it's not as much a problem as it was in years past. But there's certainly a major role for managed services to, to provide in that, in that solution. And of course, in any case, as we were talking about previously, public cloud does have a role for things like gaming and content delivery and, and core offload of functions. So it, it is always really a hybrid uh, question. It's very unusual to see a service provider put everything in public cloud. It really cannot meet all the technical and regulatory challenges that are required for that type of network. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I, I know there are strong arguments as to why you should put everything in the public cloud, but as we as we hear, it doesn't always stack up. Um, Rahul, let's come across to you as to um, where it does make more sense to go public cloud and, and where the private telco cloud maybe maybe is not the right approach. Uh, ultimately, like Beth uh, mentioned, I guess it's a it's a strategy which a company takes. It's build versus buy. Uh, if you are setting up yourself to be an organization who wants to build uh, products, uh, capabilities, a culture of owning the things in house, uh, you probably the best best choice is to go build your own. But if you are thinking to leverage the partnerships and hop onto something very fast, agile, public clouds are the great options available. Um, they also give you. Like there's a lot of toolkits available in the arsenal to to get you uh, acquainted, get you onboarded quickly. Uh, nowadays, they are also coming with a lot of partnerships across their marketplaces. You see a lot of services already being part of part of the services. We know uh, the operator in US trying to build a partnership with public cloud, even even hosting the RAN workloads. Uh, we we know a lot of partnership coming across in ORAN alliances as well. When we talk about RAN and and the difficult uh, workloads. Uh, most of the hyperscalers have already uh, bought in companies like uh, which provide the 5G core, including the UPS. So they're they're getting there. Uh, so it's a it's a strategy call. It's a it's the organization call. It's the agility versus the learning skill set and the culture you want to set up in the organization. Yeah, thanks, Rahul. There's a, a lot of considerations there for operators who are wrestling with this decision. And Terrier, let's come across to you for uh, your thoughts. Yeah, thanks. I can be maybe very short. There are a lot of good th good things to be saying, so I'll try to uh, try to avoid repeating that. Uh, 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 and but just as you said also earlier, I think uh, guy. So we, typically, I think many of the operators have a multi-cloud approach. So so that means, of course, that to mix uh, the different uh, cloud types uh, and to try to optimize across uh, the different uh, cloud instances in that sense. Uh, but we also have in Telor uh, what we call a public uh, cloud first uh, approach meaning that whenever it fits the workload and also makes sense in terms of business and technology, uh, we prefer to, to move to the, to the public cloud in that sense. So uh, we have moved uh, more than half of our IT applications into various uh, public clouds. So, so that's kind of just, uh, you know, those kind of applications and, and workloads tends to be, you know, uh, fitted to, to, uh, to work in, that, in those uh, cloud environments. But on the other hand, we have also moved more than 90% of our network uh, applications into a private cloud. Uh, so that's due to the characteristics around the, the, the workloads there. And also, as we talked about earlier, regulatory and, and, and performance requirements. So I think it's, uh, it's good, you know, to balance this across different, uh, different parts of this. Then uh, just to reiterate what uh, I think what uh, Paul was saying. Uh, and what we also have seen is that uh, the, when we do, uh, you know, our own cloud, uh, it's uh, important to remember that, uh, of course, you, you have to design it and you have to implement it, but you also have to develop it and you have to further, uh, you know, evolve it into the with new requirements, uh, requirements in terms of security uh, and whatever. And then there is also a continuously, and I would say, intensifying fight for talents. 
<clears throat> and talents in terms of recruitment, which are uh, you know ready to to work on in this uh, this cloud environment and operate and and further evolve evolve these requirements. And then not to forget about if you want to have uh, more workloads on this with third parties, there is also an ecosystem you need to attract on this, which tends to be, of course, I would say bigger when it comes to the public cloud environment pr compared to a telco cloud environment. Yeah, thanks very much, Terry. And and uh, I'm pleased you brought up the uh, the skills and talent issue as, as well, because we've uh, already had a, a couple of viewer questions in um, about that, and uh, you know questions about where telcos can can get this talent from. So that, that's great, um, Vivek. Let's come across to you um, for examples of perhaps of where it makes more sense to go public cloud rather than build your own private cloud. So the skill set. Is the workload amenable to a public cloud from a characteristic point of view? Is my ecosystem partner or the network vendor, function vendor, uh, willing to do this one way or the other? So those are the sort of CTO's dilemma, and uh, including the organizational capability, et cetera, uh, and the operational tooling that exists. Because if you do go to the public cloud for some part of your state, it doesn't mean you're entirely operating in the public cloud. You've then got a hybrid cloud strategy but your OAM chain is now split across a combination of private and public cloud. Uh, and I think that's similar to what Terry had just mentioned, Telenor has done as well with the combination of IT and network functions. So that's the CTO's dilemma. Uh, CFO's dilemma, I guess, would be, or priorities might be, depending on where that organization is at, at, at a given point in time fiscally, uh, do they want to be OPEX heavy or CAPEX heavy? And then that fits more neatly in certain constructs to a public cloud kind of commercial construct uh, although you could try and do some stuff on uh, private cloud, but then you're owning the the asset, you've got a bit more capex investment, etc. And I think a lot of effort is being put in by um, all the major public cloud providers to, if you will, get the public cloud into the edge. Um, and it's always an interesting conversation, depending on which side of the fence you sit as an operator. Because I've had one CTO tell me, how's it public cloud if it's sat in my data center? Whereas another one said, well, it's an extension, it's a logical extension of my public cloud. And as long as it can give me the same level of control, we will look to exploit it uh, for things like uh, near real time processing of the data as it's generated on the edge, typically facial recognition and stuff like that. So I think those are some of the early examples that we are seeing. Uh, there's also at least symptomatic evidence that, um, and I'm not sure, I think it was Paul, if I'm not mistaken, who referred to this, Core seems to have more subset use cases, including UPF, which seems a better fit for cloud today already, public cloud, as well as some of the edge use cases, uh, which might not have as onerous performance characteristic requirements, uh, which can only be satisfied by, by private cloud. It's the bit in between. It's, it's the access part of the network, which so far we've not seen a massive uptake on the public cloud and various reasons for that. So I hope that gives a little bit of perspective, Guy. Right? Yeah, it absolutely does, Vivek. As I said earlier, there's an awful lot to consider when you are wrestling with these questions. Um, before we go on to our next question, though, I'd like to just come over to Beth, because, Beth, I think you wanted to pick up on a comment that was made earlier. I, I did. I want to I wanna, uh, pick up on, uh, I think it was um, Paul or uh, Raul's comment about <clears throat> the ecosystem. I think it's super important to realize it's not just the uh, telco that has to build that uh, ecosystem to support the private cloud, but also the vendors also need to build cloud native applications. And yes, there has been some progress in that area, certainly with ORAN and uh, ONAP over time. Um, I would say still many of the vendors that provide our basic network services are still those services are basically still VMs. They're still not fully cloud native. Kubernetes and, and container based applications are just starting. And I've been saying that for a couple of years. And, you know, I kind of hate to say that because they should be further along. And, and to really take advantage of the cloud and really take advantage of the efficiencies, you need to move to a container based system. And you know the telcos we build we build the infrastructure, we don't build the applications. Um, certainly not you know the routing applications, not the firewalls. That's not our business. We use vendors for that, and the vendors have been quite slow 
in building the the, uh, the cloud native um, applications that we need to really take advantage of, particularly at the edge uh, of the uh, opti optimized <coughs> cloud. Um, I also want to touch on the the near cloud, you know, the regional cloud that you know I know some of the public cloud vendors have gotten into it. Um, you know, they don't own those data centers. They're typically put into telco uh, regional pops. And um, again, it's a cost factor, you know, of having to spread the resources pretty far. Um, putting putting in uh, private, private nodes, public cloud, it's, I think it's an uphill battle for most customers. Um, because it's again quite expensive, and I'm not sure they get a whole lot of benefit. Thanks very much, Beth, for that. I do appreciate it. Um, and it leads very nicely to my next question, really, which is, you know, where is the best place to host and run a network cloud? Eh? Is it centralized, distributed data centers, edge locations? Where? Um, Paul, I'm going to come across to you because uh, you you mentioned this earlier when you were talking about RAN as a as a limitation for um, the public cloud. Um, perhaps you can you can tell us a bit more. So the decision about if you're a service provider looking to build a, a cloud infrastructure today, and we've been doing this with many carriers worldwide, has got a few important criteria that's different than it was years ago when it was just NFV. With NFE, you just had OpenStack and virtual machines at the core of the network. Now you've got these edge considerations. And as edge comes into play, you may have tens of thousands of sites that are now participating in your virtual infrastructure. And the technology that you choose for this really becomes a core to edge problem where you have at the core of the network, a technology stack that can support highly scaled VM guests as well as cloud native assets. Uh, as that uh, you know evolution begins to happen and VMs decline in use and containers um, come forward, you need to be able to flexibly reallocate the compute resources in the core of the network to support that evolution. And that really means selecting a cloud technology stack that you can actually do that with. Uh, additionally, as you look at that edge of the network with tens of thousands of sites, different priorities come into play. One is now you need a single pane of glass to manage that entire distributed network. If you're going to manage thousands of sites, as clouds and each is an independent cloud, that's too much of an operational burden for a service provider. So you need a system that's designed to embrace the challenges of a distributed network, you know, from its technology stack foundations. Um, and then of course, as you get closer to the edge, it's still very high scale. You may have hundreds of thousands of computers, but at the same time, the scale is different. Um, TCO becomes very sensitive to how many nodes you place at the far edge of the network. Can the technology stack run in a single node or two nodes? When it runs there, can it run down, you know, it's all of its overhead down to a single core of overhead so that the remaining cores on the compute platform can be used for the application and thus return to the service provider the, the highest TCO benefit of running applications at the edge of the network? Can it scale and support new applications like automotive V2X or drone delivery systems that allow a service provider to provide additional monetization for the cost of deploying this edge virtualization capability? So. There's a lot of factors that go into that decision, um, but largely what we're seeing now is a service provider looks to build private cloud. It's no longer just core, it's core to edge. And they have to think very carefully about the partners they select and the technology capabilities in that solution to truly provide what they need for the next 10 years in, in their uh, infrastructure. Mm, thanks very much, Paul. Uh, it is moving so fast, isn't it? As you say, a few years ago, it was such a different landscape for infrastructure there. Um, Manish, what's your thoughts as to um, where telcos should should build and run their, their infrastructure? Um, where's the best uh, locations? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, let's start with the network and then go to the cloud. Networks are hierarchical in nature. Uh, and there is a piece called the core network, which gets more centralized. There's a piece called the access network, which has to be distributed out and about, whether you look at it from an optical perspective or from a radio perspective, irrespective. Uh, so when you think from a network perspective that they are hierarchical uh, in nature, then you bring in the cloud infrastructure and the benefits of the cloud infrastructure uh, that it can deliver and where should that cloud infrastructure be placed. And it's going to be hierarchical. You are going to have pieces that are going to be centralized where you run a lot of your IMS and core network workloads, be it VMs going forward, more containerized workloads, uh, et cetera. And there are going to be access workloads that are going to be running outs and abouts. 
there are there are there, there's a bit of a divergence right now uh, in in the access part of the network where certain operators are looking at more of a centralized RAN kind of an architecture, and there's an underlying constraint there, which is what kind of transport network do they own? How much fiber do they own? Service providers who own fiber, where there's a lot of densifications, so think of geographies like Japan and all, uh, they are looking at more and more of a centralized RAN architecture. And in those cases, those edge locations where you can actually run your RAN workloads do a lot more you know, statistical multiplexing of the RAN workloads across different cell sites that you need to serve. But there are other markets, in which case you don't have that much access to fiber and your underlying infrastructure has to be brought at the bottom or very close to the tower uh, locations. Uh, I think Paul touched on a very important point, and this is something uh, I'd like to really stress on. When we think about this distributed cloud, Automation becomes absolutely critical. And automation first has to be the path forward as service providers start to think and build this infrastructure out. Because everything, if you think about from firmware upgrades to lifecycle management of that infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, it has to be done right from the get-go. And I mean, just to give an example, we worked with uh, Dish Networks very closely uh, as, as they rolled out their networks and we brought in things like bare metal orchestration and capabilities like that uh, to them. Again, to, in a very automated way, support the lifecycle management. So as much as location, where and how is going to be governed by the workloads and the network functions that are going to be running in, automation is absolutely critical to really derive the OPEX gains. And last but not the least, I want to go back onto that monetization piece, which is once you create this horizontal infrastructure, which is going all the way out to the edges uh, of the network, it starts to create this opportunity for the service providers to really enable third-party applications, for touch on V2X. I could talk about video analytics. If some company comes up with AR, VR kind of capabilities that might require rendering support, caching, et cetera. So many uh, different use cases out there. But the point is, once you have the cloud infrastructure, it starts to open that opportunity up for the service providers to deliver this as capabilities to different industry verticals and monetize. Yeah, and that's going to be so important. Thanks, Manish. Um, this is going to be our last question round, by the way. So uh, before I come across to Terry, I'm going to uh, Rahul. Rahul, uh, some thoughts from you on uh, best place to, to host your own cloud infrastructure? As I said earlier, I mean, um, A, I don't think there'll be any future network which will not be distributed. So there's no choice to go and, and build the distributed networks. Uh, we've been talking about a lot of use cases, monetization. Uh, unfortunately, Telco has been very slow with that. Uh, and then most of the things I think comes to that there's always a third party who's doing integration. There's always a third party who's bringing the technology. There's always a multiple party who brings and stitches solutions. Um, Manish was talking about the bare metal orchestration. There are three more orchestration layer on the top before before the edge or the network becomes even even usable. Uh, so I think it's it's obviously the distribution uh, distributed network is go, uh, the way to go forward. The cloud on top is again one of the technologies to provide the hypervisor or the virtualization of the resources. Um, and then Paul said it right. The edge is not only about the virtualization; it's about TCO. You cannot put a lot of stack or server stacks there. You have to take a call that which of the nodes make sense to be there. For example, the VDU um, and the CU can be in a, in a regional data center, which probably would have a little more capacity or the backup restore of the CU could be at the, uh, at the center data center. The architecture, the, the latency, the specs have to support that for most of the uh, applications. There's also a trend to see user plane moving towards distribution, uh, distributed or more closer to the edge and the control planes into, into the centralized. Um, again, it, it, it is a combination or a factor of all the uh, ecosystem players you have, what kind of application stack they are ready with. Um, a lot of them, as Beth was mentioning, are not ready. Um, they also come with a pre-staged integration points. They also come with a lot of uh, requirements, which probably are, the more, are not the uh, more uh, ROI-based uh, thing. So uh, as an organization, if I had to make calls or if we are starting, I again come back to the same choice that start with, with your own network cloud learn about things, build out the capabilities, learn which make which capabilities make sense to to be on hosted on your private cloud and where we can leverage uh, like like the AI kind of applications, like non-regulatory applications, like 
uh, things where you want to do a lot of processing uh, infrequently uh, kind of applications. But uh, for me, it's it's the distribution of the network is is the key. Um, even if telcos are struggling to find the killer app. Thank you very much, Rahul and Terry. Let's come across to you for your thoughts about the the best distribution of your your telco cloud. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so the best distribution that we uh, I think uh, typically have had this famous answer. Then uh, that depends. Uh, but I'm coming from the you know the established telco perspective and call it brownfield if you want. Uh, uh, and then you can look into different dom network domains. I think you also addressed that earlier in, from the from the panelists. So. So, so uh, the way we have seen it, at least, is that uh, typically the mobile core, you know, it's, it's rather centralized. Uh, and, and you tend to, uh, at least in our case, we tend to you know, move that into a cloud platform uh, and still remaining centralized. So that moving from a kind of a legacy or, or, or uh, integrated platform onto a mobile, mobile uh, core on a cloud platform. Uh, but then we also see that there are custom demands, uh, for example, on uh, latency. So that's triggering distribution, uh, and that's distribution then on the mobile core into more the regional uh, level. So we are supporting, for example, uh, distributed uh, uh, gateways, for example, to support the remote driving of heavy machinery in a mining case, for example. Uh, we are also supporting, uh, you know, low latency service to connected ambulances, and a number of more, more uh, other also customer cases there, which is triggering distributing of the network uh, into a. Or at a regional level, if you if uh, if you if you want, then of course it's the round discussion. I think I don't have to repeat that. Of course, uh, open round is also triggering uh, need for 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 network clouds uh, there, uh, and then also it's not to forget about. Uh, I think it was also pointed to uh, earlier what we call edge cloud, uh, in connection with mobile private networks, and there are quite a number of cases we have there as well, which is uh, triggering uh, need for. Uh, distributed network uh, capabilities all the way to the enterprises uh, and the many of these cases are actually supporting video analytics and uh, video analytics as everyone probably have uh, been looking into generates a lot of traffic uh, and typically a lot of traffic is uh, and much of this traffic you can just uh, throw away because it doesn't really contain the information you're looking for then it's good to have the network out there and also the analytics running out there which can uh, you know improve the efficiency there and a lot of these um, uh, edge cloud and also private network cases from enterprises ask for uh, robustness or, or autonomy so, so that's also a, a kind of important aspect to, to take into account when you figure out where to place the, the, the network. Uh, but I think it's across all these cases, of course, as I said, it depends. It depends on the, on the customer and the services and the use case, uh, what you want to support. And then I think it's also maybe what we haven't discussed so far is there is also discussion about fixed access, of course, uh, and, and moving some of these functions onto, on, onto a virtualization and cloud environment. So they're quite interesting opportunities there as well. Absolutely, Terry. And maybe we'll get some questions in later from our audience about uh, um, fixed access workloads. But we must leave it there for now. We will continue this debate during our live Q&A show later on. But for now, thank you all for taking part in our discussion. So if you are watching this on day one of our Open Telco Infra Summit, then please do send us your questions and we'll try and answer them in our live Q&A show, which is coming up very soon. And don't forget to view the other panel discussions and keynote interviews in this year's event. Here's the agenda for today and the full schedule of programmes and speakers can be found on the Telecom TV website. That's where you'll also find the Q&A form and our poll question. And please download our exclusive research report from my editorial colleague, Ray Lemaitre. He really wants you to download that. For now, though, thanks for watching and goodbye.